I was already sober as well, so there was no escape. So it was kind of just like showing up every day and facing this hell. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tales from the Journey. I'm Stephanie Zamora, and today we are here with Jeff Siao, who is coming in from Australia. He is going to talk to us about his journey hitting burnout and sobriety and really leaving one career and stepping into another where he is really helping people. And I'm just very excited to have him here today. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. I'm excited to be here. I would love if you could share just a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Yeah, for sure. So I'm the founder of Mind Access Life Coaching. What I do is, is I coach unfulfilled millennials to really get clear on what they want out of their life and to give them an actionable strategy to help them go and achieve it. Beautiful and very important. I wish that is something that I had had when I was younger. I feel like there's a lot of people that, especially nowadays, think about their career and who they want to be in the world, but they don't have a lot of tools and skills and resources to really figure out, well, who am I and what would actually be fulfilling to me? And then they end up on the wrong path. So the work that you're doing is very incredible and important. Let's kind of go back to the beginning of your story. So I know that you hit burnout in 2020, but talk to us about what life looked like before that. Who was Jeff? What were you up to? What were some of your dreams and aspirations? So Jeff, before that particular point, that that burnout point um, happened in my corporate career, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that soon. Life before that was really kind of scattered because I'd spent a lot of time studying, you know, and I'd gotten many different degrees. And during this time, I've always been a bit of a wanderer. So I'd always gone from different job to career, Um, just always moving easily. I never really had any trouble you know, meeting new social circles or whatever like that, quite enjoyed it. So I was always having variation. At some points, I had three different jobs on the go. Um, I was doing my master's degree, doing my thesis, like all the things. But at the same time, also, I was partying very hard. And I spent a lot of time doing drugs and drinking and all that kind of stuff as well. So that was like in the background while I was doing all this stuff in my life. And But this period was actually, um, I wouldn't say this was a period where I got burnout because there was so much variation and so many things happening that I didn't feel like there was any stagnation. Even though I wasn't really moving any trajectory in my life, it was just so random that um, it didn't feel like there was a burnout. Did you feel like you had, because of I'm thinking about the work you do now, did you have support and guidance when you were younger when it came to picking your career path? No, absolutely not. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, it's one of the reasons why I have three degrees because I just didn't know what I wanted to do. My university had like a career mentor kind of thing. I only found that out in my very last semester of university, like in my sixth year when I was doing my master's. And it basically helped me with nothing. They they send you to do a quiz and it gives you a personality test. And it's like, these jobs are good for you. And I was like, wow, this was extremely <laughs> useless. <laughs> so kind of like my work right now is helping people, not, not career advice, but it's helping people discover their attributes and kind of their fears, what holds them back, combining it to give them a pathway forward rather than just going to career counselor and they tell you, oh, based on if you're on, say, ENTJ, you get to go and do this. Right. And uh, yeah, I found that to be not very helpful. I actually remember when I was in high school, we did some of those aptitude tests or whatever they are to give you a sense of what your career should be. And I was dead even for business. And I think it was being an artist, which are two very different paths, but are also kind of true to who I've become. So I, I feel like those things can be interesting to look back on. And I would love to hear what those kind of assessments revealed for you. And did they shape your decision when you went to college? Uh, Not really, because um, I did the assessment at the very end. Um, Before that, I kind of like dabbled with it. But my personality, see, because I was at this time partying and I was young and I was, you know, doing drugs and things like that. My personality was very different back then. So naturally, I'd always been an extrovert. But when you do different substances and things like that, it changes you. So at that particular point, I was an INTP. I remember that. I always was an INTP every time I did the test. Today, I am not an INTP. Uh, I'm probably an ENTJ. I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure it is ENTJ. So it changes. It flips a lot. It depends on your particular situation in life. That's why the Myers-Briggs test is really um, quite interesting because personality is fluid until you discover your authenticity. When you really get clear on who it is you are and you know what you are and how you want to do it and you know you're completely sober you have clarity on what you're doing that is your real personality right but a lot of the time when we're young it kind of changes a lot and that's common to see absolutely i would definitely agree with that so talk to us walk us through your academic journey and how you ended up picking the career that you were in and and paint a picture of everything that led up to that point of burnout so academic journey started when i was 17 actually i graduated school when i was 16 and i did my first degree which is human biology and neuroscience that was 
kind of just like a lost period for me you know i kind of just spent a lot of time partying and things like that that was particularly in my youth i was very lost i didn't really have any guidance so for me that was the only way i kind of knew how to do it it had a lot to do with my childhood conditioning but also we're just trying to fit in you know just trying to really get into the perth scene um in perth partying when you're young is a very um commonplace thing i'm pretty sure it is most places in the world but i definitely got into that pretty young and then after that i kind of had still had no idea what i really wanted to do so i did a master of biotechnology that one i really really enjoyed i enjoyed that degree a lot taught me about you know genetics commercialization business it was very exciting to learn about and i really focused hard on that one so uh, that was quite good. And then from there, at the time, I was working many different jobs. I was working three jobs at a time. I opened several businesses. So you can see, like, I've always, like, done a lot of things in my life. I've never been static. Like, um, staying in the same spot to me is not good, you know? <laughs> so particularly for me, when I, you know, had done this whole journey of, you know, opening businesses, going to many different jobs and careers in terms of, like, sales, hospitality, you name it, I've done it all. And then I landed in a, a job that I thought I was destined for because I had worked so long to kind of get myself into the medical field, right? I had done, like, half a year of internship doing neuroscience research and all this kind of thing, and I landed a job in clinical research. And, you know, it's one of those things where you call it, like, a big boy job. It's, like, kind of like, oh, okay, this, <laughs> this is, um you know, where you kind of, like grow up and you do the thing and when i landed into it i realized that that perception of what it was is well it's 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 not it's not accurate because i've spent so much time trying different things and when i was doing this one thing that i was, thought i was supposed to have based on like my study and my you know career trajectory where it was going i realized i did not enjoy it and i realized this about the third day in but i continued i continued for about almost two years i got promoted several times but i just kept going until the point where i reached that severe burnout during this period which was around about 2020 i have so much to say first of all you keep talking about university in college those years being a lot of partying, but the career or the studies that you did are so complex. I'm very impressed <laughs> that you were able yeah, to I've do both. Been, yeah, I've just always been high functioning in that way, I guess. <laughs> I relate. It was a little bit different for me. I went to school for graphic design and I still do a bit of design for myself and, and my business, but it was, gosh, a couple years, I think, after that, that I realized I don't want to be just another designer. Like this is not the path that I'm supposed to walk. And for me, that was very jarring. I was definitely, especially at that point in my life, I was much more of like an achievement focused, like status oriented, like I'm going to go out and I'm going to do all these great things in the world and I'm going to get the titles and I had moved up the ranks in my profession very quickly. And so all of a sudden realizing like this is this is not the path for me, at least on my journey was very jarring because I wrapped my identity so deeply in what it is that I was doing and the titles that I held and the success that I had. What was that like for you? Is it something that hit you? Was it kind of a passing thought that you tucked away? Uh, definitely the latter. You know, I was continuously tucking it away in my mind. You know, I kept telling myself, well, you know, you've studied all this science, you know, and you've done all this and this is where scientists end up um, because it wasn't necessarily lab work. It was like running pharmaceutical projects, right? So like working with big companies like Pfizer, AstraZeneca, not something that I holistically agree with, but I thought like this is where you kind of end up, right? And yeah, it kind of like really all hit me like on my third day when I realized that all of that fast paced work, you know, cause I was very fit at the time, like fast paced, doing all this kind of stuff, going and just sitting in a chair all day. That was hard for me to handle. Like it took me a long time to realize that, you know, like professional means sitting in a chair all the time, funny as that sounds. But yeah, over time, as I really got into the role and I started to get promoted, got more responsibilities, I thought to myself, well, is this really the pinnacle of everything I do? Is this really, you know, what? I'm capable of and it came very apparent that I wasn't and at this period of time as well I was starting to really shift on the inside I was starting to shift away from the party lifestyle away from the drugs I really wanted to quit COVID happened COVID completely changed my life not because I got COVID I still have not but because it made me realize more about myself it caused mm -hmm. me to slow down and really start to think about my life and I was like wow like things are not lining up very well for Jeff I'm working something I don't enjoy I'm spending all my free time doing drugs, partying, and not doing anything healthy with my life. And when you start doing this enough, and especially during, during lockdown, you begin to realize, okay, like, I'm definitely doing something wrong in my life. And that's where it began to shift. That period of burnout began to become a realization. That makes a lot of sense. I, I know there's been a lot of people, myself included, even though I was already working from home, that that 
pause that the whole world hit and that being at home and and being more isolated and things like that really caused a lot of (laughs) self-reflection and honesty and, Mm -hmm. and a lot of shifts. Before COVID happened, before you were able to kind of stop and slow down and face yourself, had you noticed symptoms of burnout? Uh, Not really, no. I had always just kind of pushed forward. Like, I've always been, like, an intensively hard worker. You know, for myself, like, I just throw myself into work and then go out and do stuff. Like, I never sit still. That's my life story. I just never sit still, you know? And then um, once this happened, I was forced to sit still. And, you know, that's kind of where I started taking stock. What were the first steps that you took? So somewhere in the middle of... 2020, I got promoted to a high position where I had a lot of responsibility and I knew that I needed to stop, you know, doing the nonsense that I was doing at the time because it had been about eight years and eight years too long, really. What I did was I had had a few seeds planted in my life that I had not realized until that period in time, but I had bought a life coaching course a couple of years ago, probably about five years ago to help me sober up because I really kind of wanted it, but I just didn't know how to do it. And I had also bought a book called The 50th Law, right? So during this period Mm -hmm. of time, I would was really needing help. I didn't know who to turn to. Um, so I started really just started reading personal development. Before that time, I didn't know personal development. I know it sounds stupid, but before that time, I didn't know personal development was a thing. So I started really reading this book and it kind of showed me the importance of sobriety. And it clicked in my mind. I was like, wow, everything I want in life is on the other side of what I'm doing right now. So that's where I kind of went down the train of, okay, I need to change things. So I really invested deep in my life coaching learning. So at this point in time, I was learning passively, really throw myself into personal development, cut off a lot of social circles as well, lost a lot of friends along the way. And I really threw myself, I did nothing but go to work, hit the gym at night and look at personal development. I did this for about six months, right? Just nonstop. Um, wow. And this helped me actually get off the drugs. It helped me get clean, completely clean. And then, you know, since then I've been able to quit smoking and drinking. I don't do anything now. I'm just, just a clean, clean, quiet dude. But um, it took quite a bit of time to cut that out. In the end of 2020, I wanted to create a vehicle to share with the world my journey of recovery. So I created an Instagram account called Your Daily Purpose. What it was about is, uh, you still find it actually, it's still on there. It, it was about me finding ancient philosophical quotes about mental resilience. I put it up and share my entire take on it, you know, share a story about how like someone can gain value from it, et cetera, et cetera. This page grew very quickly. It grew to like 3000 followers in a couple of months during the period of when I was posting every day. What really changed for me is when people start to message me, I got a lot of messages in this time where people were like, you know, like, man, this is amazing. It's helped my day. You know, this has really changed my perspective. So many positive messages coming from this page. And that's kind of where it conflicted with my daily life. It's really started to get in my head, especially in 2021. I was like, wow, I have this online avenue, which is not a business, but I've People are loving what I do. People are giving me so much love and feedback. And then I go sit in my job where it's got nothing to do with love and feedback. I'm getting paid for it. But I don't feel that same sense of appreciation for what I do for myself. Like, I feel like I'm showing up to this to get paid, but I'm showing up to that because I love it, right? That's the difference because I actually love serving other people and giving them something back from my mind and my journey. While in my job, I was just doing it to get paid and it was soul sucking. Like, I loved working with the people there, but the job itself was soul sucking. I love that you shared that about personal development to go back to kind of the beginning of what you shared because it was very similar for me and I think it is for a lot of people. It was working at a job that I hated, trying to get a design business off the ground back in, I guess this would have been 2008. And the woman that I worked for had this whole bookshelf full of personal development books and Jack Canfield's success principles like leapt off the shelf at me the way people describe it. And before that, I think I had maybe someone gave me a book once, but it was like, there's this whole world of personal growth and books and programs and websites and coaches. And it was just a very pivotal point for me. So I I don't think it's weird at all that you didn't know about it. And I think you know, depending on when people were first introduced to it, there was still some stigma around personal growth and self-help books, at least when I was first getting into it. So we talk a lot about mentors on this show. And to me, that can be anything from a coach to a program like you were working through or a book or a podcast or anything like that, or friends or family or communities. And I know that you talked about that isolation period. And I appreciate that you shared that because I think that's very common when we're making such big changes in ourselves and our life is that our ecology has to change. And that means that relationships and communities start to fall away and it can be very lonely and isolating. But 
immersing yourself in the personal growth world, was there a point that you took on any mentors or was it mostly exploring on your own? It was mostly exploring on my own. I've always been, um, I think I mentioned this before, I've always been someone that loves to try things and I work at a, a breakneck pace. So I'm always like going and exploring. Like if I find myself interested in something, I can spend like eight hours researching it nonstop because I um, I believe I've undiagnosed ADHD. So I can literally spend like a very long time doing something very specific. At this period in time, I my uncle, kind of like a mentor, uh, he's a good guy, really good guy, helped me out a lot in this period of time. So basically when I was in this period, he gave me a podcast to listen to called The Mindset Mentor by Rob Dahl. Have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. It's a very, very good podcast all about mindset improvement. It's all about learning different strategies on how to do different things in your life, like how to go out and achieve something, how to change the way in which you view something so that you look at it. So how do you achieve your goals? Um, there's like a couple hundred episodes. I listen to every single episode of this dude's podcast, like every single episode, probably twice. I just listen to it nonstop <laughs> at the gym. You know, I listen to all of it. And then I listen to this guy called Akira the Don as well. He's a person that mixes uh, lo-fi music with personal development. So all of his music is literally snippets from different podcasts that he mixes into music. And if you listen to it at the gym, you can, yeah, you can learn so much. So during this period of time, I was reading books nonstop, putting podcasts into my brain and literally just going to the gym and making sure that I push myself every day in a different way to become stronger or better fitness wise. And all I did was just flood my mind with like information information and positivity at this time. And to do that, I had to cut a lot of people out, cut a lot of things out. But looking back, it was very hard, but it didn't feel like it at the time. It felt like it was necessary. That's what it felt like. Yeah, that's a good place to be in. Even if there is grief or sadness or missing, like just knowing this is what has to happen, I think, at least for me, brings ease to certain transitions like that. Yeah, definitely. So you started your Instagram account, which I love, and started getting messages from people, which I also love. That's something that happened for me as well when I started just sharing my view and blogging and putting things out into the world and hearing from people, wow, that really helped. It was like, okay, like this feels good. Like you said, like I I, I want to help other people in the way that like personal growth and the things that I've been learning and experiencing have helped me. And that really led me very organically into the business that I have today. It's very much been feedback from people on me just sharing and also them, you know, reaching out and saying, Hey, this is what I'm going through. So I would love if you could share how you went from starting this Instagram account that grew pretty rapidly to actually stepping away from your career and starting the business that you have now. Right. So this is where the story gets uh, interesting, Stephanie. <laughs> so, um, at this point in time, I kept going with that particular account and it reached a point in like, I would say like February, March, where I, I was done. I was literally done. I had so much responsibility on my shoulders because, um, like, like I mentioned before, like I've always been a hard worker and I will show up nonstop and that kind of works against you. I learned when you work in corporate, cause they just give you so much. <laughs> so so at, a, at a point in time I had like 13 to 14 pharmaceutical projects I was running by myself with my team, meaning I was spending so much time like working on something that I didn't enjoy that I had no time for life. Like I just felt burned down and reached a point where I just go sit in the office and I'd show up and I just look at the ceiling for like an hour. I just <laughs> sit there and people ask me like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, fine. <laughs> I just didn't want to talk about it because like some days I would like kind of like break down and I would just like tell like a close friend, but I can't do this anymore. Like just too much like pressure. It was kind of like stress as well because when you work with people across the world, they all have expectations of what they want from you and there's all deadlines and there's just so much for one person to bear. And at the time I also hated it. I was trying to like get, I, I was already sober as well. So there was no escape. So it was kind of just like showing up every day and facing this hell. And in February I was like, I'm done. So I didn't know what I was going to do yet, but all I knew that was that I wanted to do something related to life coaching because I had finished that life coaching program. I purchased the accreditation. I bought another one and I actually have a couple more I bought. I just love doing this stuff. So for me, um, learning life coaching, like I've got NLP as well and I'm currently doing CBT. So I want to have all three in my repertoire, but at this period in time, I was, I need to leave. So I didn't know how to leave because I've always been really bad at uh, like leaving per se. Right. So at this point in time, especially when I was in this job, it felt like the scariest thing for me was actually leaving a salary. I realized that looking back, the salary is like, a, it's kind of like a drug, you know, it kind of like keeps you dependent on it. You feel, yeah. you kind of lose your ability to be creative. You lose your ability to be resourceful because you're so used to getting this like drip feed of money that 
you're like, okay, maybe I just shouldn't leave because I'm afraid of what might happen, right? But I was like, I don't care. So I made the decision to move to Melbourne. I bought tickets, kind of like left it all to the last minute, found this guy online, gave him like a text and he's like, yeah, you can move with me, no worries. So I moved <laughs> to Melbourne in um, the middle of July, right? I moved there on July 15th. I quit my job at the end of June. I just decided I don't care. I'm leaving. And the only way that I can make something really happen in my life is by taking such a leap of faith that there's no looking back. It's called like burn the ships, right? So I went to Melbourne, arrived there, and it was... I arrived on the day of a lockdown, like literally like the lockdown mm -hmm. went all the way from July to December, on November, I think. But like I arrived and I got off the plane and it was like, oh, Melbourne's going to lockdown. I was like, oh, no, that's not good. So um, I went quickly to this person's house and I met and we stayed. But the long story short of that is in that two month period of time, I was locked down in Melbourne. I didn't have any friends or family in Melbourne. I had no one apart from my housemate who was not a very social person. So for two months, it was me, me alone. There was no one else. And during this, during this period of time, I had learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my mind and how to quiet my mind. I learned how to change my mindset to view things differently, to view, you know, like scarcity and abundance, how to be able to communicate with people around the world. You know, my life coaching was intended to be in person. That was always what I wanted. I always wanted to, I love working with people. So my whole goal was to move to Melbourne and work with people. But it turns out that life coaching only happens online. So that's kind of where I started to shift into that avenue. I learned a lot. But during this period in Melbourne, the most important thing was I got very clear on who Jeff was. Before that period in time, it wasn't so clear. Jeff was still kind of like this person who worked in this career or this person with this baggage. In Melbourne, it was there was no one. It was just me. Yeah. So for two months, I moved back to Perth. I'm in Perth now. And I also learned that um, who was your friend as well. When, when you move to somewhere else, certain people just stop talking to you. And during that period of time, I learned, you know, who are my actual friends, who are not. You know, like where people see me or how I see myself is the most important thing. Because it came apparent to me that regardless of who does this or whatever, it's how you view yourself that makes yourself. This period was a life change for me, Stephanie. It's kind of where I overcame that burnout and it was difficult. There was a lot of anxiety during this period, but I learned how to work through my mind and my issues and really build something powerful out of it. And what I did was I created Mind Access. I spent two months working 16 hours a day because remember I told you before, I get obsessed. I really just work nonstop. <laughs> 16 hours a day, I built up this coaching business, built it up. It is where it is today. It's doing quite well. It's quite big, um, but I've just spent that's, that's how I do it. I just focus so hard. And this Melbourne period really set me up quite well. Oh, that's so inspiring. And I have several things I want to talk about, but I would love to go back first to really discovering who Jeff is. And mm. from a couple angles, first, like what that process was like, if there was anything that was more supportive and helpful for you than, than not. And then also something that we talk a lot about is reorienting. Like, what was it like to reorient to yourself? I know you're in this big, massive reorienting process with your work and, and moving and getting sober and just changing everything. But yeah, I would love to hear what the process looked like and if anything was particularly helpful and, and just kind of what it was like to reorient to yourself in that way. Reorienting to myself towards who I am today, which is, um, you know, really authentic. I'll tell you, if you ask me any question, I will answer you with truth. And being that person today feels great. Becoming that person was not easy. It's the same journey I take all my clients through because getting to that point, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions and you have to go through a lot that you don't necessarily want to face. So during this period in time, um, like I mind map my entire self. I have like a whole book. I just mind map myself. I was spending so much time thinking, deconstructing thoughts. I became very clear of my self-awareness. Like my clarity during this period in time was amazing. Every single time I felt a particular tug of fear or anxiety, I would write it down, get to the root of it and isolate the memory, right? So today there's not really much that holds me back because I spent so much of this time getting over things that I was afraid of. Like for example, I was afraid of judgment, you know, I was afraid of, you know, not fitting in. I was afraid of so much. I spent so much of my life. It became clear why I was always moving from career to job to opportunity, doing different things, even moving to Melbourne, right? Even though it was a good move. It's because I was always running. I was always running away. I was always running away from myself because I didn't know how to face myself in the mirror. For years, this is a constant process. Until this point in Melbourne when there was no choice but to face myself in the mirror. That's when I really had to take a deep dive and find out why am I afraid of certain things? What are the childhood memories? 
Why am I not made peace with these memories? Why are they holding me back? Why are they affecting my relationships with other people, right? Why am I building up anxiety or anger or things like that? Every single thing that I had pop up, I had to face because there was no one to talk to. There was no distractions. There was nowhere to go. It was just me and me alone. And for anyone looking to change their life, I would actually recommend a huge period of isolation. Preferably get a coach because a coach helps to accelerate the process. I did not get a coach. I had my life coaching certifications, which really helped me along the way, but I did not get a coach. Looking back, I definitely wish I did get a coach, but I, where I am where I am today and I made through it through alone, but not a lot of people are able to do that because a lot of the time you don't have that isolation that I had. You still have your friends down the road who want to go drinking on the weekend, right? You still have your, you know, your workmates who maybe want to go out and party every week. Like, you know, like there's so many distractions in life that pull you back to an avenue of life that you don't want to be in. And that's where self accountability or coaching accountability comes in. And if you're not going through like some, you know, monk period, like I did in Melbourne, then you're going to need some help. So for me, yeah, that's definitely definitely what it felt like to, to reinvent myself. It was not easy. And to anyone who says it's easy, I, I don't believe you because it is, it is quite the challenge. <laughs> So true. It's very challenging. I think about those memes that came out around the start of COVID that were like, we were all forced to sit at home and face our feelings. And we said, nope, absolutely not. I'm going to make bread from scratch. <laughs> like people still found <laughs> yeah, <pretty> ways. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's so powerful. And I agree. I, gosh, I don't remember when I had my first coach. It was probably a year or so after I discovered personal development, but I've had so many different coaches and mentors throughout the years and I would not be where I am without them. I mean, you can get there, but there are times where it's really hard to do that work yourself. Like it takes such a tremendous amount of self-awareness and an ability to be honest and discerning and, and face things that are, we've gotten so good at avoiding. So yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Like having a coach makes such a difference. Absolutely. It's, just, it's a shortcut to the process. And also it's having someone who's like actually pulling you through your challenges. You can do it yourself for sure. But, you know, like I mentioned before, unless, you know, you have no avenues like I did in Melbourne where I had nowhere to go, no escape, no one around me. Only then is it probably possible. But for most people, they're not going to do that. You know, you have a job, you have children, you've got a family. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit harder to kind of just like disappear from the world, right? So that's where having a coach really comes in handy. Absolutely. I would love if you could talk a little bit before we dive into more of what you do and how people can find you, but talk a little bit about really how you grew the business. I know you talked about it just a little bit from a high level, but a lot of the people in my audience, especially those who have been through some kind of challenging chapter or big life transition become very entrepreneurial or they want to create something that goes out into the world, whether that's art or writing or a book, podcast of their own, even if they're keeping their jobs or whatever it might be. And I know from personal experience and from working with clients, and I'm sure you know this too, in your own way, like starting a business is so exciting and it there's just so much that's unknown and so many different avenues that you can go. And so I love when people can share kind of what it looked like to grow their business and what worked for you, what didn't, if it was organic. Yeah. All of that stuff. Right. So, um, luckily for me, Stephanie, I've actually had businesses before when I was younger, my, I opened my first business when I was 21. I've always been, you know, super random, this kind of thing. So I opened that when I was younger, it was a, uh, it was a decking business where it was a carpentry solution business with uh, one of my best friends and we did really well. And I learned a lot about business and growing it very quickly. It's business is an exchange of value. That's what it is. If you can deliver more value than someone is willing to pay, then congratulations, you have a business, right? So I took those same principles that I learned about business from my my first business and my second business too, which is um, academic tutoring. And I put it into my coaching business. With coaching, it is very different though. I have to admit, coaching is very different to what I've done in the past. Coaching is the most unique thing I've ever done in my life. And I love it because it challenges me every day. Even, you know, like talking on podcasts, talking on webinars, I do public life speeches, you know, motivational speeches. It challenges me. I love that. I love that feeling of like, you've got to step up to be the part. You've got to step up, right? Yeah. I love that so much because you know, we're not, we're not gurus, right? We are, we're still learning along the way, but it forces us to step up and that feels amazing. Especially building a coaching business at the very beginning, I tried to do it in the same way I had my previous businesses, right? So I thought, okay, I will just make some content and run ads. That was stupid. It just did not work. It did not work. Um, to any coach trying to put out ads, I would say, don't put out ads. 
until you are at a point where you're a household name. Like if you have a little blue tick next to your name, that's when you know, run, run some ads. Now and again, maybe run some ads if you have some really good piece of content that can drive people towards your socials, but otherwise don't run ads. For me, I learned over time that coaching has to be organic. Why? Because coaching is dealing with people. You're, you're not dealing with a stat. You're not dealing with how many people clicked your link. You're dealing with people that are living, breathing, mindful you know, mindful organisms, right? They have a heart. And if you can coach and you actually want to show people you can coach, you need to go talking to people, right? Coaching is a business of conversations, as you would probably know. For me, especially when I first started my business, I did not understand this. So I'd spend hours making content or like working on my website or working on literally everything apart from like having conversations with people. Because I thought that business comes to you because it always has in the past, right? For businesses I've had before, you kind of just put on an ad and people come to you. It's, it was that easy. Coaching is not like that. So with coaching, you've got to get very clear on who you serve and how you serve them. Meaning you've got to get clear in your niche. And once you're clear in your niche, you've got to find out exactly how you serve that niche, right? Because until you know that, you can't really coach because coaching is not for everyone. Like I could not coach every age or every gender or like every situation because, you know, I would have to live like 50 lifestyles. Yeah, like it's not possible to be able to do that. Coaching is about coaching people who are in a similar position to what you were in. You're a few steps ahead. You have more experience. You've put yourself into the, into the hard yards and you guide people through that tough time so they can, they can come to a higher level, right? And that's why organic is great. You know, talking to people, putting yourself out there, being empathetic as well because you understand the situation. That's how to grow a coaching business. And on top of that also is to really just create content that people are going to learn from. That's that's my number one rule. Like I don't market. I just put out content that's like so valuable that it's like, okay, I learned something from Jeff. That's what I always do. I just put as much value as possible to my content. I don't waste my time. I don't waste people's time. I don't just say like, oh, buy my product or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm going to teach you all of this. And if you want to come work with me, let's do it. That's, that's how I like it, you know? <laughs> yes, I agree. That's definitely my strategy as well. Is share value, share stories that help people learn. And just, I mean, in my business, we produce just a ton of content. And it's, yeah, it's really powerful. What is a piece of advice that you would give to anyone who is going through burnout themselves, who wants to make a change, wants to get to know themselves better. Yeah. What would your top piece or pieces of advice be? If you're going through burnout, the first thing is to recognize you are going through burnout. A lot of the time you don't. Um, for me, I've probably been going through burnout for like about a year before I realized I was going through burnout because you think you're just tired. And then, you know, from being tired, you become like kind of antisocial. And then you're like, okay, you know what? I'm not antisocial. I'm just like exhausted. I just want to escape. I just want to run away. And then you go from like wanting to run away to like literally just shutting down and like not letting people in. You just realize this is my life now. For a long time, I was saying I have no choice. I just kept telling myself I have no choice. It was such a bad affirmation to tell yourself. Never tell yourself that, right? But I, that was the only way I could cope with my uh, my situation. I was like, I have no choice. I have no choice. So the first step to overcome burnout is to recognize you have burnout. Once you recognize you have burnout, then it's time to realize what's causing the burnout. Is it the people around you? Is it your life situation? Is it your job? Is it your, you know, like uh, your volunteering? You know, whatever it is you're doing, like what's causing you to feel like there's too much? Because burnout is when life equilibrium is taken away when you don't have a balance of like productivity and self-care and also an investment in your mind so you're not growing right so you're static you're declining that is burnout because it means that you're tired of playing the character that you're playing right now you want to you know that you're capable of more but you're just not getting after it so you've got to recognize that you have burnout recognize what's causing the burnout and once you have these two things you have to make a decision to make a change whether it's getting a coach whether it's you know moving across the country like i did and starting a new life whether it's you know just doing something new quitting your job trying a new career maybe it's taking a sabbatical but until you make a decision to change your situation will remain the same but and burnout requires action to take care of it. Absolutely. Those are really great supportive pieces of advice. Anything that you would say to people who want to get sober? If you want to get sober, you've got to understand why you want to get sober. Because sobriety doesn't come like, you know, just like that. You're, of course, we're born sober. And our default is to be sober until we are introduced to, you know, a certain lifestyle. But if you want to become sober and you're not in a good spot right now, you need to get clear on your why. Why is it you're doing what you're doing? I got very clear on my why. I got very clear on my vision of what I wanted my life to look like. And only when I did, did I realize that this pathway that I was on, 
could not possibly take me to where I wanted to go. And it was the sacrifice I needed to make. And I say the sacrifice, but not really. It needed to be done anyways. But by making that sacrifice and getting rid of that for my life, I was able to start a new life. And that's where I am today. I'm a coach. You know, completely different to who I was. But if you want to get sober, got to figure out why. Otherwise, you will relapse, you will repeat, and you go back to it over and over again. So powerful. Such a great quote. <laughs> well, to, to wrap things up, we're going to link to all of your amazingness in the show notes. But please tell people where they can find you, how they can learn from you, and how they can work with you. You can find me on social media or my website. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at mind access life coaching um you can find me on linkedin at jeff cr my name it's a little bit different you can find me on my website as well mind access life au. if you would like to work with me you can do one or two things you can send me a dm i'm always open and ready to chat i in fact love chatting so feel free to just chat ask me anything or two you can book a discovery call with me on all my socials on my website there's always a link first and foremost to book a discovery call it is completely free all you have to do is book the call at a time that suits you we will chat there are no obligations no strings let's just meet up Let's talk. I can actually offer a solution to your problem. Let's work together. If I can't, then let's just keep in touch and be friends. That works too. But that's how you can reach out and that's how you can work with me. And if you would like to work with me, I work with unfulfilled millennials. So people that are really unhappy with where they are. They're stuck. They're burned out. As you mentioned, they're not feeling well. They're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And if you're at that point where you're like, you know what, I need to change my life, but I just don't know how to do it. And I don't, I don't have the courage. I don't have the plan. I don't have the strategy. I don't have anything to be able to do. It. I'm lost. Then that's where I come in. So if you would like to learn more about me as well, you can grab my free book. I have a free book online. I have a free webinar. It's on my website, my social media. Yeah, just grab whatever you can. I have a lot of free resources. Wonderful. Jeff, thank you so much for being here and taking the time and sharing such great wisdom and pieces of advice and steps that people can take. I so appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Stephanie. It's been awesome to be on this podcast. Thank you. 